All right, welcome to Unit 5 where we're going to discuss continuous and discrete random variables. This will be a little bit of a continuation on the probability from Unit 4. All right, so in this section, we're going to take a look at probabilities using a probability distribution table. We're going to calculate and interpret a mean or expected value of a discrete random variable and see how that's different from our previous expected values. We're going to calculate and interpret the standard deviation of our discrete random variables and compute the probability using um, the probability distribution of continuous random variables. So hopefully you're sitting here um, recognizing the fact that we have two vocabulary words from our beginning unit discrete and continuous. Um, so we're going to take a look at what is the difference between those two sections or those two words um, when we're discussing random variables. All right, so the first thing we're going to talk about is a probability model. So we've um, discussed probability models uh, previously in the last section, but what a probability model does is it describes the possible outcomes of a chance process and the likelihood that these outcomes will occur. So a probability model just says what's going to occur and what's the probability that each event is going to occur. So let's um, consider tossing a fair coin three times. Let's say that X is the number of heads obtained. All right, so we're tossing a coin three times. You know that you could make a tree diagram to represent the situation if you wanted to. Notice how we're defining X. So X is our random variable. We're defining what we want it to be when we toss the fair coin three times. It's the number of heads that we obtain. All right, so let's just think about this. When I toss a coin three times, I can get three tails, a head and two tails, two tails and head in the middle, two tails and head at the end. Here's your choices of two heads and all three heads. Now, we specifically defined it to be heads, the number of heads we obtained, not the number of tails. So a probability model takes and says, okay, what was X? X is 0, 1, 2, or 3. That means when I toss a coin three times, I'm getting 0 heads, 1 heads, 2 heads, or 3 heads. What is the probability of each of those events occurring? Okay, the probability of getting 0, since there's 8 possibilities, only 1 out of 8 times will I get 0 heads. 1 is going to be there's three possibilities that I can get heads on the first, the second, or the third try. Two, there's three out of eight, and to get all three is going to be one out of eight, okay? Now, like I said, it's very important to define what X is because when you have zero, one, two, or three here, if you don't define what that is, we don't necessarily know if it's um, getting the number of tails, so on and so forth. So you just have to make sure that you define what that actually is. All right, so what would that look like in a graphical form? Notice we have the value. Always in your table you want to define the value and the probability. We have the value down here, zero heads, one heads, two heads, three heads, and then notice the vertical axis is now the probability of each occurring. So one eighth, three eighths, three eighths, and then one eighth again. What a random variable does is it takes numerical values that describe the outcome of some chance process. So this random variable X, all it is is defining what probability that we're looking at. And we're basically assigning numbers to that random variable. We're assigning probability to the number of heads obtained whenever we toss a fair coin three times. The probability distribution of a random value gives the value and the possible values for the probability. So the distribution is like the definition of the random variable plus the probability of it occurring. Okay, so when we define the random variable, we're saying, okay, that's when we're assigning numbers, the number of heads obtained to a chance process. All right, so let's just take a look at um, our probability distribution a little bit further and discuss what exactly is important about a probability distribution. So number one, you need to make sure you define X. So this will tell you what value the portion means in the table. So when, if you just write value here, what does this mean? That's why you have to say X equals the number of heads obtained when you toss a coin three times. So value zero, what do, if you don't define what X is, we don't know what that means. Make sure you include the probability of each value. So that's what the distribution means. We're defining the probability for each value. And then make sure you state that the random variable is X. So we usually use X for random variables instead of anything else, okay? Now, so let's just say I said to find and interpret the probability that X is greater than or equal to one. If you don't have X here, and you don't have it defined, you're not gonna know what this means. So we know that X is the number of heads 
obtained when we toss a coin three times, so the probability that x is greater than or equal to 1, that is telling us if we flip a coin, what is the probability that we're going to get one or more heads when I toss a coin. Now, so that means one or more. I can get one heads, two heads, or three heads. That's greater than or equal to 1. I'm going to add up the three probabilities one head, two head, three heads. So if I toss a fair coin three times and record the number of heads that we get one or more times is 87.5% of the time or seven eighths of the time because there's only one time when you're going to get all tails. Okay. All right, so there's two different types of random variables that we're going to talk about, uh, discrete and continuous. So hopefully you remember that discrete from the previous section is like your counting numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And continuous is like a number line with everything in between. It's sort of like your ruler. So it's like 1.000001 all the way up to 9.99999 to 10. So it includes every fraction decimal in between where discrete doesn't. If we can find a way to list all of the possible outcomes for a random variable and assign the probabilities, we have a discrete random variable. So a discrete random variable is just defining what probability we're, take, we're taking a look at, putting a number to it, the number of heads or tails that we get when we toss a fair coin, and then giving each of those values, 0, 1, 2, and 3, a probability, that's a discrete random variable variable. So it takes a fixed set of possible values with gaps in between. So a discrete random variable, that's when a fixed set of possible values with gaps in between, so that's like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, not 0.5, very specific, um, just to your counting numbers. Then the probability distribution of a discrete random variable lists the values of x right here. So x1, x2, x3, that's just basically like saying zero heads, one heads, two heads, three heads. And then p1, p2, p3 is just the probability of each occurring. Now, the probabilities of the discrete random variable occurring have to satisfy two requirements. Number one, these values have to be between zero and one. Why? Because you can't have any probability probability statements greater than 1. The sum of the probabilities has to be 1. Why? Because we, this is 100% of the event occurring. So here's the values and all the probabilities added up have to be equal to 1 because that's making sure that we have all the possibilities within the table. To find the probability of any event, add the probabilities of the particular values that make up the event. And that's like on the previous question we were saying that we get one or more. We're adding one, two, and three together. All right, so let's just take a look at this one. Um, let's get some practice with discrete random variables. So in 2010, there were 1,319 games played in the NHL regular season. Imagine selecting one of these games at random, then randomly selecting one of the two teams that played in the game. We're defining the random variable x, notice, we're defining it. We're giving a numerical value, the number of goals scored by a randomly selected team in a randomly selected game. That's a lot of randomness, okay? This table gives the probability distribution of x. Now see, it's very important that you define x because if we have x and the probability of x without defining it, we don't know what that means. So x is the number of goals scored by a randomly selected team, okay? And the probability is that occurring. So what's the probability that they scored zero goals, one goals, two goals, three goals, four goals, all the way up to nine goals in a game? All right, so a couple things that you want to be able to do with this probability. This is discrete because there's gaps in between. It's just zero goals, one goals. So we can't score 1.5 goals per game. That doesn't make sense. All right, so a couple of questions I want you to try answering. Show that this um, probability distribution is legitimate. Make a histogram. See if you remember what that means. Okay, you can either draw it by hand or try it on your graphing calculator. And then what is the probability that the number of goals scored by a randomly selected team or game is at least six and more than six. What's the difference between those two questions? So go ahead, hit pause, and then take a look at the answer on the next slide.
Okay, so how do we show that it's legitimate? Um, we show that it's legitimate by adding all the probabilities up and making sure that they equal one. All right, so if you add all these up, they add up to one, so that's 100% of the possibilities. Therefore, it's a legitimate probability distribution. Remember, when you make a histogram, you want the value to be at the bottom. So it says zero goals, one goals, two goals, three goals, four goals, five goals, six goals, seven goals, eight goals, nine goals, and this is the probability of each of those occurring. Okay, you can put on your graphing calculator for x is list 1 and probability of x is list 2 and do a histogram. So let's just take a look and describe what we see. The graph is slightly skewed to the right with the largest amount of probability on digit 1. Actually, it should be on digit 2. Um, and just make sure that you're remembering socks when you're describing the distribution. So socks is remember the spread, the outliers, the shape, and the center. Okay, um, and the largest amount of probability is actually on two, two and three, right here. All right, so let's take a look at this question and what was the difference between these two answers. What's the probability that they scored at least six or more than six? Now notice I'm still writing a probability statement. The probability that x is greater than or equal to six is at least six because I'm including six. So they're scoring six goals or seven goals or eight goals or nine goals. I add those up together to get 0 .061. More than six, x is greater than six. And remember, you can say this is x because we've defined it in the previous um, section to be the number of goals that they scored. We're just adding up seven, eight, and nine. All right, and then just make sure that you understand the difference between at least six and more six. At least six means that we are including six. More than six does mean that we're not including six. Okay, so what I want you guys to do is take a minute, um, pause the recording, read this, and then try answering these questions about the random variable x and making sure you remember from the previous slides what you need to include for the probability distribution. Okay, so this is going to require some of your knowledge from the previous section. So what you just have to keep in mind is that the probability that 40% of students oppose the use of student fees to fund student interest groups, that means that 60% are not going to oppose it. So 60% are going to support the use of student fees to fund the student interest groups. All right, so let's take a look at these four questions on the next couple of slides and see how you did. They're a little bit tricky. All right, so this is basically some information you needed to know from the previous unit. So the first question was saying, what's the probability that um, A and B support the funding and C opposes it. Now we know they're independent. Since we know they're independent, we can use the multiplication rule. So A complement and B complement means that they support it and C means that they don't support it. So we said that 40, since 40% 40 do not support the funding, that means 60% must support it. So A is supporting it, 60%, B is supporting it, 60%, C is not, that's 0.4. So multiply those together to get 0.144. Okay, so that's something you had learned from the previous unit. Now, this part B is a little bit tricky. List all the possible combinations of opinions that can be held by students A, B, and C. Now, I gave you a hint, the fact that there are eight possibilities. When you're doing this, honestly, the best thing to do would be to think about the fact that you have three students and figure out what the possible outcomes are before you figure out the probabilities, okay? Because we have three students, they can either oppose or support the funding, one of the two. So what are the different combinations of A, B, and C supporting and opposing the funding? So before we take a look at these probabilities, let's look at what the possible combinations are. All three can oppose them, two can oppose them, one can support it, and what? how can that happen? So two oppose, one support, two oppose, one support, okay? And then, um, over here and then here's two oppose one support and then you could also do then two only one is supporting it so one support two oppose one support two oppose one support two oppose and then the last would be that all three of them support the funding. Okay so how did I come up with these probabilities underneath it? I think this would be difficult to do 
if we did not do this part first. So here, since we know they oppose the funding, that's your 0.4 times 0.4 times 0.4. Here, OOF, 0.4 times 0.4 times 0.6. 0.4 times 0.6 times 0.4, 0.4 times 0.6 times 0.6. So you're going to have to multiply all those probabilities just the way we did in part A in order to figure out what the probability of each of those events occurring is. Okay, and then go ahead and take a look at the next video where we'll finish this question.